Hi, I'm Johan. And I'm Samuel. And you are listening to the Value Paths Podcast. And today, our episode is all about self-serve tactics that we love. So in the past episode, we were talking about the aspects of self-serve SaaS as a business model that get us excited and that we see as interesting opportunities. And we thought, what if somebody listens to this and they say, yes, this sounds interesting to me. How do I get started? What do I do? And we can't answer that question universally for everybody, but there are some things we've observed to generally be low-hanging fruit along these lines, working with different companies that will probably apply to your company, at least in some way. Is that a fair description, Johan? Yes. These are no-brainers, irrespective of what your context is. These are a few things that you might want to consider. You don't want to blindly follow tactics without data and research in place. But that being said, if you're going to make educated guesses about how to create more business value, these are pretty good guesses in our experience. I like both of those points regarding data and research, because on the data side of things, if you're not paying attention to how your revenue is performing over time, you're not going to be able to tell if these are making your revenue perform better over time. And then from a research standpoint, we do feel, or I at least feel strongly when I was coming up with my own list of recommended tactics, I found that a lot of them were kind of empty if you just approach them in a superficial way. Spoiler alert, one of my recommended things is to look into lifecycle emails more. And really the important thing there is not to send lifecycle emails with more sophistication or to send more of them period or to send them more often, although maybe mm -hmm. all of those things are relevant. To me, the really important thing is that you're sending emails that move people, that motivate them and that harness their existing motivation to go in and pursue the outcomes that are driving them to find your offering relevant to begin with. So for me, I, that was something that I struggled with. And I, I didn't know if that was its own tactic or a meta tactic or what, but like, having some theory of the value expectation that you're setting in your value proposition and leveraging these tactics as ways to help usher people along within that context, rather than just things that you can staple onto an existing product and assume will move the needle. Right. They don't say know your customers for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> so with that said, Let's dive into the tactics. I know that I've got a list that I'm pretty excited about. I let one little cat out of the bag early. So, Johan, do you want to start with your number one? The first tactic we'd recommend is to familiarize yourself with the critical pathway. And by the critical pathway, we mean all of the steps that users have to take in order to complete paying you for the first time and actually becoming a customer. So you can go as far back as you like, and you can go as far forward as you like. The first payment is just an arbitrary milestone that is easy to optimize for. And as far back as you like, a familiar signpost for us in that regard is sign up, but you can go as far back as them encountering your offering for the first time. But let's say for the purposes of this conversation, we choose sign up as point A and becoming a customer as point B. What actually has to happen between those two points? What do users actually have to go through? And what are the necessary steps that they have to take? Because understandably, you can't map out every single screen that they see between these two points, because especially if you have an expansive product, the number of paths that users could be going down is infinite. The permutations and combinations are mind boggling, but the necessary steps, surprisingly, turn out to be just a handful. They have to create an account. They have to set a password. They have to verify their email address. We don't recommend this, but just <laughs> for example's sake, <laughs> they have to find value in some way. There's some activities there. Then they have to go through your billing flow. They have to press an upgrade button, provide card details. The necessary steps that they have to take between point A and point B, you can map those out. And when was the last time you did that? When was the last time you looked at how many users make it from one step to the next? What's the drop-off like between each step 
in the critical pathway. Yeah, fully agreed. And even if you aren't looking at the data and are just trying to do this heuristically, it helps in our experience just to map them out and just look at the screen states side by side, like in a big Figma board or something along those lines. Figma board, does that make me sound like an old? It's probably like a Figma <laughs> canvas or something, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> but the point being like, just thinking about there are a lot of, generally speaking, a lot of overlooked points of friction, especially in your signup experience itself, that are just kind of sitting there collecting dust. Johan already mentioned, like, we're proponents of removing the email confirmation step as one of your earliest activation steps and pushing that as far back as possible, even if you do need to do that for account security and things like that. Another one is like so many times you see a, a sales survey asking how many employees are at your company and so on and so forth. A lot of different things that you're asking people to do that are probably not ultra relevant to what they're trying to accomplish. And a lot of times the biggest performance gains that you can get right out of the gate are just by going in and removing the points of friction that are irrelevant to the user's value creation process and might be hindering your own value creation process. Right, right. Just a yes and here. Traditionally, when you're laying out an experience like this, you're not laying out the screens that users actually look at. You're abstracting away from the real experience and coming up with some kind of model, like a user journey map, you know, at an abstract level in order for users to get to another abstract concept, the aha moment, then they would have to go through these steps. How many people are actually making it through these steps? We are not recommending that. We are recommending actually laying out the screens in the Figma canvas, lay out the screen side by side. And rather than thinking about aha moments, think about conversion. And instead of thinking about time to value, you know, manufacturing a valuable milestone super early in the user journey, instead think about momentum. Think about how easy it is from users to move from one step to the next, even if it is an eight step process, how can you keep that momentum going all the way to conversion rather than just an abstract aha moment or a manufactured step two that you think might be valuable to users, but you don't actually know. I agree. Just, I'm just nodding over here. You can't see it, but I'm with you. Yeah. So I'm just trying to point out that we know that map out what users go through in your onboarding experience or to your aha moment that gets said a lot, but we don't want you to take away that we're recommending the same exercise. We're recommending a similar exercise, but approaching it a little more holistically and a little more, you know, closer to reality than what you'd usually get if you were using a model. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that a lot of user journeys are based on wishful thinking of how it would be cool if it worked out that way. And maybe you want more people to follow that particular experience that you're outlining. But if it's not representative of the logistical steps that are functionally required for a user to self-serve themselves through, then it can skew itself toward kind of a cartoonish, just so story sort of level fidelity. Right, right, right. Okay, tactic number two. All right, so we just outlined how you can evaluate your own critical pathway of going from sign up to customer and talked about how to remove points of friction, especially in the form of unnecessary steps, so on and so forth along those mm -hmm. along that route. Tactic number two is to take the steps that do remain, the ones that are critical for your own business's value creation, and ideally have some sort of overlap with your user's value creation process, and enhance those steps to be ultra relevant to your user's immediate interests. So there's a, an acronym that I use, W-I-I-F-M. What's in it for me? And I don't mean me personally, I'm thinking what's in it for me, the user. Anytime there's a screen that has a user do something, 
You want to present the doing of that thing within a context that they care as much about as possible. And this is something that I really don't see reflected in a lot of onboarding experiences, certainly not often in billing flows, so on and so forth. So thinking about what's in it for me, the user, at every single step. And even if you're saying something like, okay, go to your inbox and click a confirmation link, what's in it for the user? Why should they care? Maybe it's to help keep their account secure. That might be an interesting way to frame it. If they cared about keeping their account secure immediately after they provided a username and password and nothing else, maybe kind of low leverage in that situation. But that's the kind of thing where there, there's a story. I don't know if it's a story joke. I don't know. An amusing anecdote, maybe a metaphor, something like that, <laughs> where a parable. I don't know. It's kind of like if you need to give a dog medication, if you need to like give it a pill, you can try to hold its mouth open like you're like an alligator wrestler and then throw the pill in the back of its mouth and then try to keep its snout shut closed long enough for it to swallow it. And then inevitably the dog just spits it back up. And then you've got this slimy pill that you got to try to pick up off the floor and do it all over again. <laughs> or you can just put the pill in a meatball and the dog eats it right up. And so of the steps that are providing value to at least one of the two parties involved in this whole process and transaction of the steps that are in place that you can't cut out. How do you wrap those steps in a meatball as much as possible so that you are able to help people understand why it is contextually beneficial to them to participate in the process that you have outlined for them each right. and every step along the way? Ideally, right. not just generic things like keep your account secure, but ideally things that ultimately speak to the value that users are bringing your offering into their lives to try to actualize. Right. This could happen on two levels. It could happen on the, we need to keep your account secure and therefore you need to perform the step. It could also happen on the, I remember in one of the teardowns, Samuel, you had this great metaphor of laying bricks and the ultimate point of laying bricks is to build a cathedral, but it's so difficult to think about the cathedral when you're busy laying bricks. So the more that you could call out the cathedral that users are there to build, the easier it is to contextualize the steps that they're performing at the moment. Because when you're in the weeds of the steps, it's so difficult to remember how they connect to the bigger thing that they're there to do the bigger value that they're there to receive, the more you can call out the cathedral on an individual step level, the better. 100% agree. That's the super meatball. Yeah, yeah. So there's the little meatball and there's the super meatball. And, <laughs> and the other way that this helps is that with each call out, you're setting expectations. You use the meatball not just to tell people that they're in the right place and on track to get the value that they're here to receive. You're also setting their expectations, especially if there's if it's a hard task that they're involved in. When expectations aren't clearly set and users think they're going to get to value in two steps because everybody's trying to make that time to value shorter. When you get to the step that the company has told you is a milestone and it doesn't really feel like a milestone, your momentum just disappears. It evaporates. Here's, here's what I'm hearing from you. Mismanaging expectations. Like you want to harness their motivation, but a la meatball, mismanaging their expectations erodes trust, which will undermine your conversions. Right, <laughs> right, right. So you want to use the meatball, not just call out the meatball, but use the meatball to set realistic expectations. That's how you keep the momentum going even through points of difficulty. Yeah, I think one thing to consider there especially is looking at the expectations that your acquisition efforts are setting. So what kind of value propositions are being made on your marketing site or in your advertisements or 
ideally even what are people saying about your offering through word of mouth, so on and so forth. And taking those expectations into mind, thinking about how well your software offering helps follow through on that to get people to where they're ostensibly trying to go because you've been out setting expectations that are enticing and drawing people in. You want to make sure that you're reliably getting people to the places that you, in some sense, promise them that you could through your value proposition. A lot of times the aha moment that people choose to usher users to, or, you know, the, the user behavior that they choose to be the linchpin of the entire conversion experience is based off of some correlation with business value. So they've looked at successful users. They tend to do this thing in the trial experience. And so all users are funneled into doing this particular thing. Let's just say it's create three projects. Okay. So there are two big questions about creating three projects. One, how does creating three projects tie back to the cathedral, you know, the bigger point of value? And two, where in the user timeline does creating three projects occur? Is creating three projects like an early step that I have to do in order to get to value? Is it a later step? Is it somewhere in the middle? Expectation wise, how far along the timeline am I after I've created three projects to getting the thing that I've come here to get? And when apps don't communicate this kind of stuff, users create three projects and then they drop off because they don't know, they don't have the answers to these questions. They don't know how far along the process they are. And on the other hand, they don't even know how important three projects are to what they want to do. Yeah, it reminds me of a popular growth. I don't know if it's a growth hack. There was a Facebook had seven friends in three days, I think. And right. Twitter had follow 30 people, I remember at one point. I believe that if somebody went into Twitter and eventually followed 30 people over time based off of starting with a few people that they already knew and then seeing who those people were following or who was getting retweeted or whatever, maybe there is some sort of inflection point at following 30 people that signals that there's an emergent organic sustainable growth pattern there or something along those lines. But the thing that comes to mind for me is I remember not long after that piece of lore was made public, when you would go through Twitter's onboarding experience, they would show you 30 different accounts on one screen at one point and have them all defaulted to checkboxes that say, follow this account. And so like they literally manufactured in, but you know, just using basic interaction design principles and leveraging cognitive biases to just like auto follow 30 people basically. And those are people who you don't know. I think it was like Barack Obama and you two or whoever, like a quarterback, like it was just a bunch of different people. And maybe mathematically you could prove out the fact that doing that resulted in more people converting or, or sticking around or improved your viral coefficient or whatever. But the implementation changed the behavior in a pretty clear way, I think. You would have to think that would therefore add a lot more noise to the signal to noise ratio. Right, right. It's crazy how, and this is a bit of a tangent, so I won't spend too much time here, but it's crazy how the system, the self-serve system is largely composed by the activation lever and the conversion lever. Like these are the two levers that you can manipulate in order to have the system produce more revenue. But look at the logic that we have in place for choosing an activation metric. If it doesn't align with user value, if it doesn't set the right expectations, if there's a mismatch of expectations after users have activated, then you've lost a lever in this system with only two levers. It's crazy. <laughs> Well, don't get me started, but just to chime in on the tangent, I think that it is naive to assume that there is only one aha moment that all of your customers need to experience in order for them to want to become and remain customers. And that it's something that needs to take place 
after they sign up. If you're saying the aha moment is when the light bulb goes off and that light bulb only goes off four screens deep into a long, tedious user flow, why not have the light bulb go off before they even sign up to begin with? What's wrong with your marketing and positioning where people aren't saying aha until they've gone in and like actually set things up and only at that point do the puzzle pieces finally click into place and they understand what the heck they've been investing their time toward to begin with. Right. A very actionable tactic here is to have some kind of version of your site up on the website, an interactable demo of the product on the website. SavvyCal does this really well. You can actually on the SavvyCal homepage, create a meeting with a hypothetical person, but you can use the product to actually create a meeting. You don't have to dive into the product to do that. But of course, that being said, creating a meeting is kind of like creating three projects, you know, how does that one connect back to the value prop? And two, after I've created a meeting, how close or far away am I from realizing the value of the value prop? Yeah, I guess what we're saying is like users should not be getting major light bulbs going off just by operating the functionality of your feature set. <laughs> it should come from mm -hmm. what they think all of those things are going to be combining to be something bigger than the sum of the parts in their life. We are ultimately creating software to help usher people to improved circumstances. And ideally, we want to be gearing the entire process and the steps that create that process around getting them to those improved in circumstances and knowing which ones, which sets of circumstances are aligned with the best customer behaviors and get people to value as quickly as possible and which ones are just frankly not worth your design time. Right, right. Okay. Well, this got very philosophical. This was supposed to be our <laughs> down to earth tactical, but let's try to, let's try to zoom back out again. I had my favorite that I couldn't resist to mention earlier, lifecycle emails. I think that a lot of companies are doing lifecycle emails. I think a lot of companies are doing lifecycle emails poorly. A lot of times when you sign up for something and convert as a customer, you'll get, welcome, here's a long rambly email with links to four different unrelated things for you to just pick through and savor like a fine wine. And then <laughs> nothing until it's two days before the end of your trial. And then we say, where have you been? We miss you. Companies are like tapping their watch going, your credit card, excuse me. Right. And then there's a receipt usually of some sort. I know that there are companies that are doing more with, with lifecycle emails than that. But when we talk again about what are the expectations that we're trying to set with people, how do we harness the right motivations toward the right user outcomes? All of that is ideally something, well, even just back to your point, Johan, a second ago, where you're talking about setting realistic expectations across multiple timelines and multiple degrees of challenge over timelines. Not everything that's valuable to a user is going to be able to be accomplished in the very first session, unless right. if your product is just like mind numbingly limited. But the, there are things that are going to take time and that are going to take multiple sessions of activity to actually follow through in completing. And lifecycle emails are one of the few ways that your app can be getting back on somebody's radar and pulling them back into a process that they might be unfamiliar with, they might not be thrilled about doing, they might be willing to procrastinate and do anything else other than make it through that. And you're re-engaging them, hopefully in a meaningful way and not just tapping your watch and saying, hey, we wanna help get you to success. Let's do that over the long haul via timely, relevant, meaningful lifecycle emails rather than either just total silence or only talking about our own needs or just sending a bunch of different lifecycle emails that are theoretically relevant, but just doing kind of a spray and pray tactic. Right, right. I think a helpful way to think about this is to not think of your lifecycle emails as just product support. You know, most people think about lifecycle emails as ways in which to re-engage users in order to get them back to the app where the real stuff is happening. Sure. Instead, 
Instead, think about lifecycle emails as a legitimate way in and of itself to generate user progress. You're not trying to nudge people back into your app. You're trying to nudge people along their path to value. Right, right. So lifecycle emails are a great way to push people along the user timeline instead of just a way to push people back into your app. Because that puts a lot of pressure on your app as well to push people through the user timeline. And it's very difficult to to have the kind of deliberately designed experience that you had for the first session. You know, let's just say you you have an onboarding flow in place. It's really difficult to do that for the entire user timeline all the way up to conversion. How many sessions does that take? How many screens are you going to have to provide in-app scaffolding for? It's just too difficult. Um, Lifecycle emails, on the other hand, are not difficult to get off the ground or redesign or do whatever you want with. So they're a great resource to move people along the user timeline instead of just nudging them back to the app. I love it. What else you got for everybody, Johan? On lifecycle emails, are we done with this tactic or was, shall we move on? I was attempting a <laughs> smooth segue. Okay. <laughs> a theme to this episode has been taking conventional tactics that people already know about and implement and just making them more effective and talking about how to execute them better. And with tactic number four, that remains the same. Everybody knows the importance of sending out an invitation. If one person is using the product, how do you get their collaborators to use it as well? How do you get their coworkers in and have them all use the product? Invitation design is critical to the land and expand strategy that most companies seem to be taking these days. But again, we think that invitation design isn't designed all that well, and that it could be way more effective if designed with the user timeline in mind rather than the business timeline. Fair, Samuel? You had me up until the user timeline, business timeline. I don't know if people know what that means, and I don't know if I know what that means in this context. In order to make the most number of people possible interact with the invitation CTA, companies will put it right up front in their onboarding experience between steps three and four, before you've configured a single thing in the app, before you've even seen the app in some cases. They'll say, hey. A lot of cases. Inviting people to a software experience you have not yet yourself experienced. Right. And they'll put the invitation CTA there and say, this is the perfect time for you to invite people. And that's what I mean by it makes sense for the business because that's when you get the most eyeballs on your CTA, fine. But it does not make sense for the user because on their timeline of getting to value, um, it's completely misplaced. How could I possibly invite someone into something I haven't seen or evaluated as yet? How does this benefit me? We FM. I'm telling you, <laughs> we have them all day, every day. <laughs> well, I, love and it. I would say I would even push back a little bit on the business case of having the invitations presented so abruptly, because like, if you think about how it plays out, like if in a B2B sort of context, self-serve B2B, if you're inviting teammates to a project management tool, to anything that you're bringing them in to collaborate on, Ideally, the person who cares the most and is the presumably the person signing up who's driving the adoption of this within their organization would like to go in and set things up for people before they arrive and just all encounter the same empty blank experience that says, you have no projects to manage, get started, and that's it. Ideally, you want them to be inviting people to something that has been enhanced by the user that they know, and not just the same cold robotic, you don't have anything, empty states that the initial person is going to experience. I think really the convention of having invitations up front came more from the grow at all costs, Twitter, LinkedIn, growth hacker world, where if your company is living or dying by its viral growth rate, then you might want to really front load that invitation request, especially if it's something where 
the social aspect of it is inherently part of the value that people get, then, you know, you get one person to download the app, that person sends three invitations out on average, and then those people send out another two. It's like a big invitation Ponzi scheme kind of thing. Yeah, that I can yeah. understand. But like in the business context that you were talking about, I think it's actively hurting that business's bottom line to do something along those lines beyond also the whole eroding trust, presenting users with irrelevant stuff, points of friction for them to overcome, reasons to drop out of the funnel, et cetera. Yeah, I had no idea that was another thing we got from the social media companies. That's my armchair historian take on it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but you know, a lot of a lot of companies blindly copy what other companies are doing and and especially right. the stuff that successful companies are claiming was successful for them, but you know, what works in a viral social media context is not going to help your you know, small businesses succeed necessarily. Two completely different contexts. So Samuel, if we don't recommend that businesses place the invitation up front, what is a good place to place the business invitation? Where in the user timeline would you recommend they place it? To your point, it's when the user's circumstances would demand, or not would even demand, but when the user's circumstances would imply that that would be appealing to them. What's right. in it for them? You want it to be something where they go, ah, I know what's in it for me. I need to go get Jeff from accounting in on this so I don't have to deal with the QuickBooks integration or whatever. Those right. are contexts of clear benefit to a user. I'm not saying that you can automatically know all of those, but that's the kind of situation in which I would recommend presenting a sort of invite friends or colleagues type call to action. Or even in a more consumer sort of example, if you had just climbed the leaderboard in a video game, that could be a moment where you say, hey, let your friends know. Or if you were to say, you, if you invite your friends, you get more credits to play the game and they'll get some credits to play the game. Then it becomes like a reciprocal sort of altruism kind of thing. And so you know, aligning them with moments where a user might ostensibly go, oh, yeah, that would be cool if I did that, rather than, oh, I guess I will comply with their instructions. Right. You want to use the user timeline to figure out where to place the invitation rather than the business timeline. Anything else to add on the subject? I would just say that to consider another user timeline, which is the experience that the invitee has, where they are going to be receiving some sort of email that was sent from somebody. Maybe they know them well. Maybe Jeff from accounting doesn't have any idea who you are. And so <laughs> if it's just something where like the subject line is the name of your app and it says Samuel needs your help and it's just a link to something that they've never heard of, that's going to be probably a pretty low converting email. Like we were talking about with lifecycle emails, that's probably not going to be a great performing one, but that's on a really critical moment in the overall customer journey that we've been talking about. Again, all of this is assuming that, that inviting people and getting multiple users involved is a part of your overall business model. If it is, let me put it this way. There are a lot of companies that presumably depend upon getting you know more users per account maybe because they charge by seat maybe because it makes it stickier maybe because it unlocks more user generated content that adds more value for their teammates whatever that might be if that is a critical component of your business model most companies don't really design it that way usually what they're getting is some sort of call to action that we keep talking about invite your teammates and then maybe there's like a multiple line thing suggesting that you should feel bad if you're only inviting one teammate and you should be inviting multiple others instead. And then a button for you to push and who knows what happens? Presumably they get an email. Does it come from you? What does it say? What is it suggesting that person do? I suspect personally that a lot of times, even if you are going through the process of inviting your teammates, your Jeff from accounting, you're probably sending them a side email in parallel to that being like, Hey, I just invited you to the thing. I want to get this bookkeeping wrinkle figured out. So please let me know when you've done whatever it is that you're really actually asking them to do. That's probably not taking place within the actual invitation experience. 
there's usually no opportunity to preview what the email is going to be saying on your behalf and what kind of expectations it's going to be setting with Jeff from accounting. There's very rarely any opportunity to go in and actually change the messaging to reflect something that you would prefer. And then if and when Jeff from accounting gets the email, understands what the point of it is and decides to comply by pressing whatever the call to action in the email is, then Jeff from accounting is going to go through an entire onboarding experience of their own. And a lot of times the invitee onboarding experience is even less considered than the primary onboarding experience, even if that's something that is, again, a make or break function of your business model. And so thinking through, like, if we're really talking about setting our goal of having four plus users per account, what does it look like to become a not the first user? A lot of times it's something that organizations have almost completely neglected. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of cathedrals, are you talking about four different cathedrals in this case? Like th that each invitee has their own thing they're pursuing? Yeah. What does value mean to each of the four people using this product? How do you set expectations with each of them? Or unite them around a common thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. You could unite them around a common thing, in which case they all need to care about What's the common thing that they care about? It can't be creating three projects, right? Right. Samuel needs your help to follow 30 people on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. So activation becomes that much more complicated when you consider that you're speaking to different roles within a company and different situations and different considerations. It's sort of like if you're in a heist movie, you've got the demolitions expert, you've got the getaway driver, you've got all these different people performing different roles and everybody's united around the heist going well, but they also yeah. are serving different individual functions. And if you're talking about a value proposition that hinges on those individual functions going well, you want to take the time to account for all of that and really think that through in a very, just a pure logistic kind of sense in addition to understanding what the individual actors' motivations are for performing their individual functions themselves, right? Right, right. So tempted to open the door on segments, but we will leave that for a future episode. Oh, teaser. I love it. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess on that note, that means that this episode is drawing to a close. These are just the top, tippy-top, no-brainer, low-hanging fruit kind of recommendations that we often see. But if you're interested in improving your own self-serve SaaS performance, these are some of the areas that we would recommend looking at first. All right, that's a wrap on this episode. If there are some tactics that we've missed or there are any that you'd like to bring to your attention, we would love to hear about them. The conversation is happening at selfservesass.com if you'd like to drop by. And until next time, Take care and keep fighting the good fight. Say it before you <laughs>